Heavenly Father, we this morning want to praise you, want to thank you for who you are, Lord. We want to thank you for your heart that is so big. We thank you, Lord, for the love that you just lavish on us. We thank you, Lord, for desiring to be with us for an eternity. We thank you, Lord, for creating us for that purpose. We just praise you, Lord. And this morning, we want it to be all about you. We want to understand, Holy Spirit, more about who we are before you. So teach us, Holy Father. And I ask that you just give us the courage to move forward and nudge us forward, sometimes outside of our comfort zones. We just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Good morning. Good morning. There are lessons floating around. Um, I should cut a lot in the front here, but make sure everybody has some. Okay, there's some back here uh, and a Bible. Okay, we need a lesson and a Bible. We are in Romans. Uh, no surprise. We are actually no surprise in the 14th verse of chapter six. Now I almost am hesitant to say it, but this is the third Sunday. We are doing this verse, okay? So it's actually part three, and this, is, and we will be moving on next week. But I thought it was very, very important for us to understand about the law, okay? And what the law means. Um, the verse says, 6.14, Romans says, do not, sin, do not let sin reign over you, master you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. This is the verse that we've been studying. Apostle Paul tells us that sin is no longer our master. That's good news. For everybody who struggles, that's good news. We're no longer sin's slave. Which means, when sin, if there is, like, takes a person, sin says, do this, you can say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not your slave. I don't have to. You can't make me. And we've been talking about how, actually, when Christ comes and he purchases us with his blood for the first time, we are free to disobey sin. Okay? Now that we've been bought, we have a different master. But we do have a master. And Henry's sermon today is talking about that, okay? We have now traded the master of sin for the master of grace. And Jesus tells us that grace is a different yoke, okay? It's a different master. The yoke of grace is easy. The yoke of grace is light. But you still have to think of grace as a yoke. And a yoke is something that you put on an animal to control it, right? So Paul is telling us, What's going on? What he means by law. When he says you are no longer a slave of sin, and the law is no longer the master of you, you're free from the law, what does that mean? So we've explained that there's three types of law. Ceremonial law, which means you have to wash your hands this way, you have to do things this way, you need to button your clothes this way. Ceremonial law. Civil law, how a country is run. And then there's the moral law. You shall not kill, you shall not envy, you shall not, you know, Lie. Those are the moral laws. Okay, three types of laws, and um, Paul tries to explain. He says, "Okay, you're free from the law, but first, before you we move on, understand what the law does. What are you free from? So you have to kind of get a really good sense of what the law is and what grace is, because he's putting the two together. So the first, and this is a little bit of a review. The first one, which I've just mentioned, is that the law is like a yoke." It's like this thing you put on an animal to control it. It's put on your neck to control your behavior. It tells you how to behave when you drive, how to behave when you're in a store, how to behave when you're an employer or an employee, how to behave when you run for political office, how to behave when you are at school, what you do with your money at the end of the year, how you behave with that money, how you behave towards the poor, Okay, it's all about how you behave. It dictates to us our actions. But it doesn't change us. It just controls what we do, not who we are. It just tells us what to do. The law is a yoke. The second thing we talked about is the law is like our guardian. When we're too young, too immature to decide things for ourselves, the law comes and tells you, let me tell you what to do. As our guardian, it teaches us how we should be. It restricts our behavior. It limits our rights and our freedoms. And we talked about that last week. But at the right time, when you become of age, when you are mature enough, you're now given freedom to decide for yourself what to do with your money, with your time, with the things that you have. In the same way, the Jews, God's people, were given the laws as a training period. And I've talked about that. In the desert especially. They're like toddlers in the desert. 
They were told what to do, how to do it, for how long to do it. It was teaching them how they should live until Jesus came and freed them from the rules and the regulations and gave them their inheritance. Said to them, okay, you are now free to do with this stuff what you feel to do. Before Christ came into your life, this is how we are. We were under the bondage of the law. We were stuck with very few freedoms. But now that John Christ has come and freed us, he's bought us, now we've come into our inheritance. And this is what Paul's explaining. Now you have freedom. Freedom to do what? Okay, we're going to start discussing that next week. Freedom to, to destroy myself? The Bible says choose life versus death. Obedience to God is life. Disobedience is death. But now we have the freedom. So this is what our guardian. The third one was the law is like being a child of a slave girl. Now I'm not going to go into the whole thing about um, Hagar and, and um, Sarah, but the concept is that um, a child of a slave girl does not have grace, does not have freedom. You live under bondage. And Paul tells us that we are now actually children of a free woman. We are free. We are under grace. We are children of the promise. We are miracles. We have been born anew. This is now the terminology he's using, okay? No longer under the law. No longer a slave. No longer a child of a slave. You are now free. And free to do all the things that a free person can do. The last thing, last week, we talked about the laws of debt. And we've been talking about this. The law comes and tells me, you can't do this way, you can't do this way, you can't do this way, you can't do this way. Okay? And my actions, my disobedience, now has caused me to have a ledger of debt. And the debt is huge. And Christ comes and he pays the debt and he wipes my debt clean. So Paul explains law as well as, as a car, as a debt. And we basically, I guess, declare bankruptcy and get so declare free. We're done. Done with that concept. We are free. Our debt's been wiped clean. We're no longer in debt to the law. Okay, now we have to start understanding that. So this is what he's explained the law. Today, we're going to the fifth example, which is that the law is like a shadow of things to come. Okay, the law is a shadow of things to come. Think about that, a shadow. Let's open up Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. And as we describe all these different things that the law is, I want you to think about yourself and your relationship today with the law and with grace and how you live your life because it's very important. Okay, so Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Somebody have that? <clears throat> For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image. Yeah. Yep. And not the very image of the things. Can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. Okay, so let's, let's look at this verse a second, okay, in Hebrews. For the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come, okay, it's a shadow of good things to come, a reflection, and not the very form of things, can never be the same sacrifices year by year, never by the same sacrifices year by year, which they did in the Old Testament, they offered continually, make perfect those who draw near. In other words, what? What is, what is, um, what's the problem with the law? Because what were they doing in the Old Testament? Do you remember? Continuously. Morning, noon, and night, they were doing sacrifices. You did something wrong? Sacrifices. You had a festival? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Sac continuously. Never stopped. Okay? And it says here, they could never buy those sacrifices over and over and over, okay, become perfect and draw near to God. So, what's the problem with the law? What does it say here? It's it not the way what wrote the, the sin or the, the thing created against the law. The, as a matter of fact, may you have fire. May you? Fire. A fire. Fire? Fire. Fire. Futya? No, fire. Fire. Oh, a file. Oh, yeah. It keeps a ledger, huh? It keeps Perfect. all the file, yeah. Okay. Okay, and absolutely. All, all those things, and someday they open up. And, and then it comes out. All your, all, your, all your dirt comes out to the open, okay? So the sacrificial system of the Old Testament is a temporary thing. This is what he's talking about here. But I want to ask you something about shadows. Because I want you to think about, when it says he's a shadow, can it just your hand? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to answer your question, the previous question, that uh, 
but it doesn't seem proportional. You know, I sin, and my punishment is death. And instead of me dying, I had a lamb die. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it's illogical. We've talked about this before, okay? I murder somebody, I kill a lamb, and somehow I'm, I'm, I'm forgiven. What is the lamb, what is this going to do with anything, right? We, we've been talking about this, okay? There's something not quite right. And what Paul says here in Hebrews is, or whoever the writers of Hebrews, is that um, what do you have to have to have a shadow? Think about physically. What does have light. There needs to be a light. Without light, there is no shadow. Right? Okay. Apostle Paul is saying that the light will do away with the shadow. When the light comes in full mid midday light, blazing light, there are no shadows. You and I are going to see and walk in that light. Okay? That, that what was going on before, the law is just simply a reflection, a shadow of what's to come. And who's the light of the world? Jesus. So when Jesus comes, we don't need that sacrificial that sacrificial system anymore. All of the rituals of the Old Testament were a symbol of what Jesus was going to do in his ultimate sacrifice. That's what Henry's saying here, okay? It does not make sense in the Old Testament when they took a little baby bird, if you were poor, or if you were, if you were wealthy or a little larger an animal, and sacrificed it so that you would be sinless. Well, it doesn't, that's not, and so God could be appeased. None of that makes sense. It was all a foreshadowing. It was all looking to Jesus, what Jesus was going to do for us. Once Jesus came, we saw the real sacrifice for our sin. We no longer needed these sacrifices. So the reality of the Christian life is found in a person. It's not found in rules, regulations, rituals. It's not found in rules, regulations, and rituals. It is a relation with a person. If you insist in living under the law, then you're just going back to the shadow, and you're not living the light. You're not living the way God wants you to live. And this is what Paul's trying to explain. And we're going to talk about, but what do you do with the law? Okay? But if you think that you're going to live your life and be good by the law, you've got a problem. Sixth example is a mirror. The law is a mirror. So let's open to James, Hebrews James. James comes after Hebrews. Chapter 1, verse 22. Okay? Chapter 1, verse 22. I'm going to break this up a little bit. But if you have that, James chapter 1, verse 22. It says... Prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. Okay? So, prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely, merely hearers who delude themselves. So what is James telling us? Don't just sit there and listen. Get out there and do something yeah. about it. Don't just come into Sunday school class and take notes. <laughs> if you do take notes. Okay? That doesn't do anything. Henry gave an example of the, of the man that had two sons. Huh? He said, go do this. One son said, yes, I will, and didn't. And the other said, no, I won't, and did. Okay? And the question of the Pharisees, well, which son did, was, was obedient? And which one was obedient? The one who did. Right? Okay, this is, this is the issue here. So James is saying, don't just come take notes. Put it to practice. Okay, 23 and 24. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, okay, now this is what he's like. He's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away. He has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Okay, so James is telling us, he's describing a person who listens only to God's word is what? What kind of person? Yeah, here, but what is a here like? According to this, what's shallow? An example. What, but what's the ex actual example? What does this person do? Looking at a reflection of himself. Yeah, looks at yourself. You look at yourself in the mirror. You kind of look, you know, you look in the mirror, and then you go away and you completely forgot what you look like. Completely, you don't even think, think about it. Okay? That's what he says. Someone who checks himself in the mirror, walks away, forgets. But let's look at verse 24 again. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what? No, what? Actually, what, he looks like. what he looks like, what kind of person he is, which implies what? So what does the mirror do? Shows you who you are. Shows you what you look like. Do you understand that? So the Bible says that the law of God shows you who you are. It tells you what kind of person you are. Okay, here's the law and all these rules. Tons of rules. Civil rules, 
ceremonial, moral, tons of rules. So, Adam breaks these rules, Rhea breaks these rules, Trish breaks these rules. It tells you kind of where your, where your problems are, who you are. Not all of us break all the same rules. Do you guys understand that, right? So the mirror, the law, tells you who you are. Okay? It tells you who you are. But it doesn't change you. Does a mirror change you? No. It just reflects. The mirror cannot change you. All it does is show that you're dirty, or that you need makeup, or that your hair needs fixing. It reveals your condition. It doesn't cure you. That's what the law does. It doesn't fix you. We've talked about it. It controls you. It makes you go 60 miles an hour when it says 60 miles an hour. But when there's nobody looking and you're positive the police are all sleeping, you might be bombing down 100 miles an hour. It does not make you law abiding. You understand that? Okay. It doesn't cure you. So what can cure you? Your, your inner will can cure you. Okay, so then we start to say, how do you do that? you have to make that decision. So, how did, so let's look at this. Uh, this is my question number seven. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Okay, let's go a little bit to the left of your Bible. First, Second Corinthians, chapter three, verse eighteen. Second Corinthians three eighteen. Okay, because there is the law is a mirror, but there is another kind of law that will change you, will cure you. Okay, will turn you from an ugly duckling to a beautiful swan. Okay, it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Adam, you have that? And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Okay, now this is an interesting thing. Um, and I know that over the years Henry has coined this term. It's called navel gazing. Navel gazing. It means this you look at yourself to see who you are, and you just get stuck there. Okay? There's a point to looking at the law to see who you are because you, it identifies your issues, your problems. But the more you look at who you are, actually it's pretty depressing. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether you've spent time with a therapist. Okay? The longer, I mean, it's like... Um, and what you can am actually I, get used to who you are. You kind of, yeah, it's... Uh, it's kind of um, one of my favorite programs on TV, HBO, In Treatment. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's, uh, it's basically a therapist that has five patients, and over the, the season, he sees those patients. And um, one of the things is just like, you know, they, they leave, it's almost like they need to go see a therapist after they see the therapist. Because it's, it's, it's sad. They're looking into the depths of their depravity, and all you do is see a depraved person. It does not cure you of the problem. It just identifies the problem. But now look at what... Second Corinthians, what Paul is telling us here. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So now we're going to look into a mirror the glory of the Lord. Not yourself, but you're going to look at the glory of the Lord. Again, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. What is this saying? What We're cures you? Into how are you being transformed, though? Specifically, how? What does it say? What's the specific cure? The Spirit. His likeness. And doing what with his likeness? What are you doing? You are gazing, you're meditating, you're dwelling, you're just focusing like this, just like you do on yourself. But this time, you know, on yourself, you're looking at your zits, you're looking at this thing wrong, this thing wrong. Now, you're paying attention to whom? Glory the Lord. glory of God. To a God who is perfect, who is complete, who created you, who loved you, who was amazing, who has amazing standards, who says you're the apple of his eye, who died for you, who, who cleaned your slate, who everything for you. And you sit there almost mesmerized by this God. And Paul says that becomes the cure. Why? Have you seen couples that lived with each other for 40, 50, 60 years? What seems to happen? They look like, they look like each other. Don't they? They talk alike. Yeah? They have the same mannerisms. I mean, they even say that people with dogs. Huh? If you hang yeah. out, I 
I mean, isn't that funny? The other day, uh, I was walking with Annette Booth, and there was this tall uh, uh, French poodle, was a kind of tall poodle, and, and, and the woman was walking from behind, she was tall and lanky, and they looked very similar. Yeah, they looked very similar. This is the concept. This is why the Bible says, sit there and meditate on God's Word. Okay? Sit there and think and meditate on the beauty of Jesus. And that cures you and starts to transform you. Not immediately. How does it happen? How does a couple start to sound like each other? Well, they've been living with each other. They, they know. It takes time. It takes time. This is the concept. That, um, and this is what the whole purpose of Bible study is all about. So you send, it's not like a quick run. It's like you sit there and you pay attention. You kind of take it apart because you want to. And then you start saying, wow, and you fall in love. And then you just look at yourself and you think, oh my gosh. And, 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 and it's what's, you look at the law and you think, oh my, this, this is really, I have no problem over here. And then you look at God and you see Jesus and how did he do it? And oh, Jesus didn't do it that way. Well, how did Jesus do it? He said, come and take my yoke upon me. I, I, have, I have grace. Come, let me show you. Okay? And you start to become changed one step at a time, one moment at a time, one year at a time. That's the concept. As we gaze on God's goodness, as we memorize, absorb His, we become transformed into His likeness. It's a different kind of mirror than the law. Yeah? And finally, we see the law as a husband. Now, we've talked about this before, but let's go back. Romans chapter 7. We'll go back to Romans. Romans chapter 7. Finally, Paul talks about the law as a husband. Okay? Now, he's going to talk about divorce here, but it's not really about divorce he's talking about. Let's, let, me, let me read this to you, okay? Uh, Romans 7, 1 to 3. Do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? What's he saying here? It's always with you. The law is only with, always with you for as long as what, though, Karen? As you're long as you have life. Okay? These laws, these civil laws, ceremonial laws, moral laws, are only have power over you, are only a yoke to control you as long as you live. If you're dead, they don't, they're not going to control you. Okay? The law is not concerned about a dead person, how fast they're going to drive. Right? They're not concerned about a dead person doing what? Cheating or lying or stealing. It's, 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 it's not, the laws are not for the dead. They're for the people who are living, okay? For the married woman, verse 2, is bound, now he's, he's going to this kind of concept, is bound to the law to her husband while he is living. When you get married, there's something you write. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a covenant, okay? You promise to, to do what when you get married? To honor, to obey, whatever. Okay, to cherish, okay. You're, you're connected, yeah? Okay. Is bound by law to her husband while he's living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning the husband. A widow is released. She doesn't have to worry about the dead husband. You guys understand that, right? Okay. So, George, you're laughing. What are you laughing about? What did they say the husband died? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, I'm scared now. Verse 3. Okay, Romans uh, 7, verse 3, okay? Let's look at that. So then, if while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she's called an adulteress. Right? That's what you call adultery. You have a husband and you sleep with somebody else, you're an adulteress. But if her husband dies, She's free from the law. She's not an adulteress, though she's joined to another man. You guys understand that, right? Okay? This is how this works. So what is Paul saying? He's not talking about divorce here. So don't start taking these verses as like a reason to do this and that. But let's, we're talking here about the law. That the law is only valuable, is only important to you when? As long as you're alive. Once you're dead, you're no longer obligated to the law. Any type of law. I don't care what it is. Okay? The marriage contract is only binding if your partners are alive. So, what Paul is saying is that before Jesus, before Jesus came, the Jews were married to the law. Okay? Before Jesus came, the Jews were married to the law. And the law was a very domineering husband. Mm. Domineering. 
You know what that means? Domineering? Yeah. Control. 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 Yeah, yoke. Yeah. Okay? The yoke that almost like strangles you, suffocates you, tells you what to do. The law is a domineering husband. You don't want to be married to the law. The law as a husband is bad news. He's the kind of guy that comes in and writes a list of do's and don'ts and sticks it on your fridge every morning. Can you imagine a marriage where the husband daily comes in and says, okay, here are the regulations for the day. Okay, this is what you're gonna to do today. You're gonna to get up, you're gonna make the bed. You're gonna wash my clothes, you're gonna cook my food. You're gonna do this, you're gonna do that, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that. I come home, you're gonna sit and serve it. You're gonna to go to bed at eight o'clock. Tomorrow you're gonna get up at six, do the same thing. That's not much of a marriage, is it? No. That's not a relationship. And this is what the Jews, this is what the Jews were married to. What did he say? What did you say? <laughs> well, I think you could do the same thing the other way around. And I'm just laughing at the same thing. Okay? It's not a relationship. And the Jews, this is what they knew. There were so many rules. And you know what? They didn't even just allow the rules for Moses. The Pharisees added more things. Rules, books, and books, and books, and books. So it's almost <coughs> impossible for anybody to do anything correctly. They were always in the doghouse, if you want to think about it that way. Always. The husband was never happy. The law was never happy. And so the sacrifices were happening over and over. Those poor animals. Over and over. Killed and killed and killed and killed. So that it could... What? I don't, it didn't even make sense. This is the concept. And Paul says that this is what we are now free from. We have been set free. This new relationship is a loving relationship, not a domineering one. Look at Romans 7, verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, we died with Christ, okay? So that we serve in newness of the spirit, not in oldness of the letter. Now we're gonna start talking about this next week. Newness of the spirit, grace, not oldness of the letter. It's a relationship of grace. And so why do we now obey Christ? Okay, Paul, you've explained to us what the law is. The law is a yoke, the law is a guardian, the law is a mirror, a shadow, a slave. Okay, all right, so now we're free from that. Thank you very much. Well, okay, so I don't need to obey Christ. Why do I now have to obey Christ? What do you think? I would think to give thanks and glory to what he's done for us. And okay, as gratitude. Um, but there's even something more, because I've, I've said this quite a few times. Karen? I think by obeying God's law now, it will lead me to grace when I die. Uh, in my future. Okay, now let me let me rephrase this. this sort of which went off. Okay, let me tell you why. Okay? The point is, we're not obeying God's law now. We are obeying grace. Or grace. Okay? Jesus says, my yoke is easy. Grace is a yoke. Okay. You are not free. This is why you obey Jesus. You're not free. You're, there's no, nobody here is a free agent. You understand that? We were slaves of sin, and now we are slaves of? Grace. Christ. <sighs> we had a domineering husband before, and now we have... A, a husband who pours grace on me even when I don't deserve it. You guys understand that? We are not free agents. Okay? There's no thing. Don't think you are a free agent. You have been bought by a price, which is Christ's blood. And now he says, you're free from that bondage, from that horrible husband. You're free. Amen. Free to do what now? Free <laughs> to obey me. Okay, I mean, you guys get that, right? So we obey Christ, not because, yes, we do it out of gratitude, but this is the, you have to understand, we also do it because we are now slaves to Christ. Okay, but this is the concept here. Okay, this is the concept. We obey because he loves us. Because we love him. Because he wants the best for us. This is our husband now. Before the husband wanted to destroy you. It was like, oh, let me see what she's, how she messes up today. Okay, so he comes home from a long day of work and he comes back, okay, let's, See how many demerits you get today. Our husband now is a whole different story. He comes and he says, oh, Show me where you shine today. 
Show me the beautiful things you did so I can be so proud of you. Okay? I know you've been doing amazing stuff. Let's see what you've done. This is the husband you have, okay? He wants the best for us because why? He sacrificed himself. We are free to love God because we are free from the law. I want us to start understanding that. Okay? So let's return to chapter 6, verse 14. 6, 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but you are now under grace. You see, you are under something. So the answer is, well, because I'm under grace. That's why I have to obey Christ. Okay, you understand? I have to still choose life versus death. Okay, so we get that, right? So, what does it mean that we are free from the law and under grace? Number one, we don't get to heaven through the law. You guys understand that? You're not going to get into heaven by doing good things. You're not, again, I'm going to say it again, because I know some of us come from different traditions. You're not going to get into heaven by doing good things. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. No matter how good you are and how many good things you do, you're not going to get into heaven because domineering. Because that list is so long, there's no way you're not going to, you can do everything right. You have been, you know, you, you've been condemned. Okay? You are not going to do good things to get into heaven. Number one, yes, Susan. I want to know that the Jews who have the law. And I'm going to talk about that in the Old Testament, right? Let me tell you that. The Jews from the Old Testament, under the sacrificial system, again, they did not go to heaven because they obeyed the law. They went to heaven because they had faith that this system was a shadow of something to come. Just like you and I, we go to heaven because we have faith that Christ, who came, is now in the past, okay, was the thing that saves us. It's the same thing. We look to the back, the Jews look forward. Do you understand that? It's faith. Again, it's faith. The faith is what believe. The faith that you believe that Christ has died for you. They didn't understand as clearly as we do today, but this is the concept. Okay? Any person with any amount of brain power in the Old Testament will say to you, killing the lamb does not make you a good person. I mean, think about it. Don't, don't think that they were duped. Killing a lamb does not make you a good person. Taking a dove and cutting its head and shredding it up and throwing its heart, it's not, not going to make you a good person. Matter of fact, in my mind, and some people who love animals are going to think you're really bloodthirsty. Okay? So it doesn't make sense. It was the faith that it was a shadow of things to come. It was a symbol of something to come that God had a plan for them. Okay? This is the concept. So the law, obeying the law, what did it do for you? Yes, uh, Henry. Well, it only takes one sin. Yes. You get voted out. It's a problem, isn't it? Right. So, it, that's, uh, that's the problem. That's what Paul talks about. That if you if you did all the, uh, the nine commandments but not the ten, you're done. You're done. So, it doesn't matter how good you are, how uh, meticulous and diligent and everything else. If you miss one, you're done. However, Henry, let's say you miss the one and you're done. And you do the sacrifices. What are the sacrifices going to do for you? still not going to do it because you have to have trust that by doing that, again, it's the obedience of faith. When you trust Trusting that, God. What you're doing. Exactly. Because that's what that bad is. That's God's exactly. description. Do you understand that? It's faith. kind of like when Naaman had to go and was it Naaman who went into the yeah. uh, to the river, Jordan? Okay, he had, he had leprosy. And the little girl told him, God says you need to go into that Jordan River and you need to dunk yourself what, seven times? Yeah, Okay, well, okay, I'm sure Naaman has swum in that river many times. That river was a dirty river. The river did not save Naaman. It's the faith that did it. Do you understand that? Okay, so it's the concept. God says, this is what's, do this and you'll be saved. It's the faith. It's not the action. Okay, you need to understand that. Okay, it's the faith, but no force the doing as well. And then, that's yes. That, that's what Naaman basically said. He was really upset. He said, what? Don't we have a river sea in Syria? Why should I go down? Much down nicer down? rivers. Yeah. It's illogical. <laughs> See? And he, did it. and he was because healed. It's the faith. So the second thing is, what does it mean that we are free from the law and under grace? Second thing. We don't get to heaven through the law, but Romans tells us, what are the wages of sin? Yeah. Death. Yeah. 
So what happens? Because I am now free from the law, what am I free from? Yeah. Yeah. You understand that? So this is the two things that happens. I no longer have to worry about the law to go into heaven. And thank goodness I'm no longer worrying about being dead. Okay, this is the concept. Romans 3.20. Let's go into Romans 3.20 a second. Before we finish. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. This means Old Testament and New Testament. Some people think Old Testament is works, sacrifices, New Testament is grace. Absolutely not. That is the most illogical thing I can possibly wrap my mind around. But somebody would think that in the Old Testament, if you went and killed an animal, now you're all of a sudden a good person? How on earth is that possible? It was faith. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It's that mirror that tells me, oh my gosh, I'm really not as beautiful as I think I am. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Okay? We don't keep the law in order to get to heaven. None of us can keep the law and get to heaven. The Jews were never saved by the law. They were saved by looking forward in faith, as now we look back in faith to the Messiah. It's the same concept. Some say the Old Testament, as I said, was law and the New Testament is grace. No way. God has always saved his people the same way, through grace. John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 17. John chapter 1, verse 17. Come to have that? John chapter 1, 17. For the law. Okay. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay, there you go. The law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Now we're going to talk next week, what do you do with the law and the grace? Okay, but right now I want us to understand this. And let's go to Romans, back to Romans, chapter 10, verse 4. Romans, chapter 10, verse 4. It says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay, so here's the law in the past. And here's Christ. The law is here to control you, to guide you, to teach you, because you're too young to know yourself. To tell you, you touch fire, you're going to get burned. To tell you, you drink water, it's good for you. You wash your hands, you don't get germs. This is what the law is all about. And then Christ comes and says, you know what? Enough already. You've been taught enough already. You've looked in the mirror enough already. You know you've got zits. You know you've got blemishes. You know you've got problems. You know. Now what are we going to do about it? Now come and look at me and watch the way I do life and look at my beauty and look at my love and my grace and just, just stop and let that sink in. And you will become transformed. Do things the way I've done them. You know, in the Old Testament, it was do this, do this, do this, do that. When they asked Jesus, well, what is the law? He said what? Love God with everything you are, everything you have. It's simple. He's not going to tell you, don't do this. Okay, you know what? Let's make it real simple for you. <laughs> Who are you? You've got a brain. You've got a body. You've got a will. You give it all to God. You love God with everything you have. Yeah, but what about this thing? Is it everything you've got? I guess you love God with that. Well, what about... What, you know what it is? You see what I'm It's simple. Christ has come and made it simple. Oh, and just in case you don't understand, you love God with everything you have, and what about your fellow man? How do you love them? You love them like? Okay, I don't think there's anything left, is there? I don't think there's anything left. So this is the concept. This is simple. This is now has been distilled to something very simple. There were volumes and volumes and libraries filled with do's and don'ts. And now Christ says, it's come to an end. Enough already. I think the law has convinced you that you've got a problem. And now let me come and throw grace over that problem. Let me wipe the ledger clean. Let me show you who you are in me. I think of you as precious. I know who you are. I know how 
big and heavy that ledger is. I know that you're an obstinate people, and yet I love you. I choose you. Let me pour grace over that. And as I pour grace, and as you pay attention to that grace, and you focus on me, not yourself. There's a problem when we overdo it on ourselves, huh? Focus on me. You will start becoming like me, and you will start becoming transformed. That's what's all about. Christ ends the dominion of the law. That harsh husband is gone. Righteousness comes through believing that Jesus has freed you. We needed this background to understand the next chapter of Romans. We really need to understand what this law is all about. But now we're going to start talking about why we can't do what we want to do. What is our struggle here with sin? Why do we not have the power to do what we want to do? We're going to discuss the Christians relating to the law. But what I would like us to do, just I have just a few minutes, I want you to just think about this a little bit. I want you to think and meditate that this freedom that you have from the law now, what does it mean to you? What does it mean in your daily life? This freedom that you understand now, the law is not there for me to obey and get into heaven. The law is showing me God's heart. The law is showing me, well, you know what? It's a good prescription for life. Okay? Do you serve Christ out of love or out of legalism? That, that's the word that we use in theology, legalism. We know that. Oh, you're being so legalistic. What does that mean to you? Legalistic. What does that mean? Somebody's legalistic? What does it mean? Just abiding, abiding by the letter of the law. Exactly. Okay? It's like, ooh, 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 I have to do this. Ooh, ooh, I have to do this. Oh, ooh, okay, okay, I have to do this, this, that. That's legalism. Not understanding the spirit of the law, but being uptight about the letter of the law. There's a difference. But, I, you know, it's an art. And this is what we're going to start talking about. Living your life as a Christian is an art. Because a relationship is something that's free and flowing. You get that? So this is the concept. This is the thing I want us to understand. Do I live my life in fear of the law? Am I afraid of that domineering husband? Am I afraid of his car pulling down the driveway? And I hear the beep, 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 automatic lock of the car. And he's coming in the house. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I, haven't, I forgot to do this thing. Oh my goodness, I forgot to do this thing. What will happen now? Oh, I'm in trouble now. And those of you who've lived in an abusive relationship, I think you get that. You understand oh, yeah. the fear of that. And some of us, the sad thing is that some of us live our Christian lives in fear of God like that. Because we've been trained that way. Oh my goodness, if I haven't done this thing, I didn't do this right, I didn't do this, I'm in trouble. And I want us to think about that this week. I'm gonna, let's talk about it a little bit next week, okay? And finally, is, what does grace mean to me? Apostle Paul has done a very good job, I think, and we've spent three weeks on it. Grace, pouring on us something that we do not deserve. But pouring it on, and you pour it on, and you're standing firmly now at the throne room of God, and you say, I am the apple of God's eye. Okay? And you focus on a God like that, on a Christ like that, on the Holy Spirit that's inside of you that makes it possible for you to live that way. And you say, you know what? I am not afraid of God, though he is scary. I am no longer afraid, because you know why? God calls me friend. He calls me friend. And when God of the universe calls me friend, there is no stopping me. There's no stopping me. And it's all about God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, that you help us and you wash away our past of fearing this domineering law. That we have to be good to be accepted. We have to be perfect to be loved. We have to do it exactly right so we can get the A's. Always this, this concept of, of looking at the letter of the law. Lord, ask, we ask the Holy Spirit to come and flood us this morning with your love and your grace and your acceptance. And yes, Lord, we do know our imperfections. We do know where we have failed. But as we think about you, as we think about your beauty. Lord, we do believe you. We take you at your word and we say, yes, Lord. 
I today will be more like you than I was yesterday. And with your grace and with your truth, tomorrow I will be even more so. And by the end of my life, Heavenly Father, we are assured that day by day, day by day, we will look more and more like you until the day that you come when we will instantaneously be like you. We just praise you and we thank you that we are free <coughs> from the letter of the law. We are free from that burden. And this morning, Lord, we are now under the yoke of grace. Teach us how to be. Teach us, Lord. And we just praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>